Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Discover Downtown's Black History Month pop-up shop. My name is Rose Garlic. I am the Discover Downtown Information Center Manager. We have a great virtual presentation for you today. Our speakers will also be available after the presentation through 3 p.m. State Representative Geraldine Thompson and Dr. Cassandra Williams-Kelly will be available to answer questions about their books as well as signed copies. Trinae Jones has various items from her rated clothing line available for sale. Beginning today through February 3rd, in honor of Black History Month, we will be offering a 20% off discount on everything in the store. The discount will be available both in store and online. Please be sure to use the promo code BLACKHISTORY20 at checkout. Every February, Orlando Mayor Buddy Dyer and City Commissioners celebrate Black History Month by highlighting the lasting contributions and positive influence of black Americans in the Central Florida community. In an abundance of caution and to avoid the spread of COVID-19, all activities and events in the celebration of Black History Month will be held in a series of dynamic virtual workshops and panels covering important issues such as mental health, nutrition, educational opportunities for African-American youth, faith and spirituality, the positive impact of black entrepreneurship in Central Florida, as well as celebrating our African-American vibrant cultural and artistic expressions. For more information over upcoming uh, of our upcoming Black History Month events, please visit our website, www.orlando.gov, or check out our social media outlets for information. Between 2007 and 2017, the number of African-American firms rose 34.5% from 1.9 million to 2.6 million, accounting for roughly half, 49.9% of, of all small businesses owned by people of color. This is a clear indication of important contribution of African-American entrepreneurship in our country's economic development. This is true to Central Florida as well. Small businesses owned by African-American employ many in our great city and they're a critical piece in our collective future as we work together to expand opportunities for all. The City of Orlando and the Downtown Development Board are committed to supporting our African-American businesses community to achieve success. Although the pandemic has changed the way we do business, it has not changed our unwavering commitment to inclusion diversity and equity. This is the reason why we're doing this event. The vendors here are examples of tenacity, perseverance, and resilience. Before we begin today's presentation, I would like to remind you that you can interact and add your questions in the chat box throughout the presentation. All, all questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. You can direct your questions to any of our three speakers. There will be a rotted clothing t-shirt raffle throughout the event. Please paste your questions and everyone that places a question will have the opportunity to win this t-shirt. I'm honored to introduce our first speaker, State Representative Geraldine Thompson. Representative Thompson will speak about her contribution to the city of Orlando, her book, Black America series, Orlando, Florida, and her current capacity as a Florida State Representative. We are fortunate to have Representative Thompson here with us today to share her life experiences. Please give her your undivided attention. Thank you. Thank you. I am delighted uh, to be with you today to talk about the presence of uh, people of African ancestry here in Central Florida. Going all the way back uh, to the 1500s, African Americans were in Central Florida. The first person of African ancestry uh, to come to the Central Florida area was Estefanico. He was a Moor from Morocco. And he came with a Spanish expedition uh, because he was a map maker. And as they traveled throughout the heavily wooded area, he drew maps so that other people could follow. And he sent those maps back to Spain. And when the Spanish arrived uh, near St. Augustine and they looked and saw the beautiful flowers and trees and everything was in blossom, they called the area La Florida, which is Spanish for the land of flowers. So uh, we say Florida, but it was named La Florida at the very beginning. And then you had people who uh, stayed in St. Augustine. They were Africans and they stayed in an area that was called Fort Mose. It was a fortress 
and it was for uh, people who were escaping from slavery. And Fort Mose is right outside of St. Augustine. But not everyone stayed there. Some came uh, further down. Uh, those who came to where we are now in what is called Orlando joined forces with Native Americans. They joined forces with the Seminole uh, Indians. They became, uh, became known as the Black uh, Seminoles. And they were engaged in a battle to maintain control of this area. And one night in 1835, on the bank of a lake, there were uh, soldiers who were there to make sure that the Native Americans, the Seminoles, the Indians, uh, did not harm the settlers. One night on the bank of this lake, there was a battle. And one of the soldiers was killed. He was buried on the bank of the lake and a big wooden marker was placed over his grave with his first name on it. And his first name was Orlando. And people would travel through the area, see the big wooden marker and they would say, there's Orlando. And when the city uh, was named, it was named Orlando. When the post office came to Central Florida, it was named Orlando. But there was one very important thing that brought a lot of African Americans to Central Florida after emancipation, which occurred in 1865. 15 years later, there were two white entrepreneurs, uh, both uh, with the first name of Henry. One was Henry Flagler, and the other was Henry Plant. And they had come up with a new method of transportation where they had big uh, cars rolling on rails. And the rails came to Orlando in 1880. And right here on Church Street, there was a station where people could get on or off uh, the train. And uh, that became known as the Church Street Station because everybody, uh, there was a segregated depot. So everyone could come to the Church Street Station and get on the railroad. The Church Street Station uh, is still there. The depot where people came is still there. And that's how many people came into the area. In 1880, one of the first churches for African Americans was built and it was called the Mount Zion Missionary Baptist Institutional Church. It was built on Washington and Chatham in a wooden building. And then later in the 60s, in the 1960s, it was uh, made of stone. But Mount Zion Missionary Baptist Institutional Church is the first church in Orlando for African Americans. Uh, the people who were coming into the area wanted to be educated, and so they started a school in 1895, and the school was called Johnson Academy. It quickly became overcrowded because of all the people coming in, and one of the professors, whose name was L.C. Jones, owned land at Washington and Paramore, and he donated the land and got other people to help him build a brick revival um, structure for the school. And because of his generosity, the school was named for him and it became known as Jones High School, established in 1895. And as you've heard about black owned businesses, there were many along Church Street, uh, along South, along Division, Throughout the South, the railroad tracks have separated generally the white community from the black community. But in case anyone, uh, anyone was confused in Orlando, there was also a street that was named so that you would know that there was a line of demarcation and that street is called Division. And Division is still there. There have been numerous efforts to rename uh, that street, maybe Unity Way but it is uh, still there. When I came to Orlando in the 1970s, I wanted to uh, learn about my new home. And I remember calling a public library and asking 
uh, for history on the African American community. And I was told that there was no history. And I'm, I was shocked because every community, every people uh, has a history. And I said that to the librarian who said, well, there's, there are no books. And so I decided that we needed at least a book, one book. And I started working with a group. We were involved with an oral history project. And we interviewed pioneers like uh, Arthur Pappy Kennedy, uh, Napoleon Knapp Ford, uh, James R. Smith, people like that. And we recorded their conversations on cassette tapes. And we asked for photographs, we asked for anything that they would give us uh, so that we could show what their lives were like. Years later, I sat down and transcribed all of those cassette tapes. And I took the pictures that we had collected and I wrote a book which is called Black America, Orlando, Florida. The book uh, contains over 200 uh, photographs, the cover uh, you can see here. And sitting at the very front of that gathering of people is Dr. William Monroe Wells. He is seated next to uh, Dr. Richard V. Moore, who at the time was president of Bethune-Cookman College. And so that book, through photographs and explanation, gives you the history of a lot of the growth and development of the African American community in Orlando. The Wells Built was a project of Dr. William Monroe Wells, who graduated from Meharry Medical College in Nashville, Tennessee. There were only a, a nine institutions uh, that would educate African Americans who wanted to become physicians, and Meharry was one of those. Dr. Wells read about Orlando in the newspaper, and when he graduated from medical school, he decided he would make Orlando his home. And so he came to Orlando and uh, built a home in 1921 on South Street. He also built a performance hall and he booked big bands, uh, names that you and I have heard, Duke Ellington, Count Basie, Billie Holiday, uh, Dinah Washington, came to perform at the South Street Casino. When they finished performing because of the laws of segregation, they had no place to stay unless a family would take them in. And so Dr. Wells requested a building permit from the city of Orlando. Uh, it was issued in 1926. And he opened his hotel three years later. And people asked, why would it take three years to build a two-story uh, structure? And uh, the reason is that Dr. Wells could not get um, a loan. And there was redlining. And if you were west of division, you could not get a loan. So he had to use money from his medical practice and from the South Street Casino to finance uh, his hotel. And when it opened in 1929, he called it the Wells Built Hotel. And it was listed in the Green Book, which was the basis of an Academy Award winning uh, movie recently that showed places in the United States where African Americans uh, would be safe and would be welcome. And so uh, on a national level, all kind of people came, when they came to Florida, when they came to Central Florida, they lived at the Wells Built Hotel, now the Wells Built Museum. Uh, people whose names we know, Thurgood Marshall, who worked for the NAACP and came to Orlando to defend the Groveland Four, could not find any place to stay in Lake County. No one would rent him a room. And he used the Negro Motorist Green Book and located a hotel 40 miles away in Paramore. And he checked in at the Wells Built Hotel. Paramore was the center 
of the African American community, uh, both in terms of businesses, uh, both in terms of culture. The South Street Casino attracted people from um, many places, Sanford, uh, Kissimmee, they all came to Orlando, usually on Saturdays, to shop and to listen to the musicians who were at the South Street Casino. So I have capsulated a lot of uh, this, this history uh, for you. And um, Dr. Wells, as I mentioned, lived in Paramore. So did Dr. I. Sylvester Hankins. There's a park named for Dr. Hankins in the Washington Shores area. Dr. James R. Smith had an office on South Street and he expanded it so that women, black women, could deliver their children there uh, because they had to go to Orange Memorial to the basement to deliver their children in the colored ward. And no matter whether you had just delivered a child or someone was suffering from tuberculosis, they were all together in the colored ward in the basement of Orange Memorial. So Dr. Smith, uh, built what he called a lying in hospital on South Street. So Paramore was the economic hub. It is changing. And in order for us not to forget the importance of it and what it used to be, you have the book, you now have the Wells Built Museum of African American History and Culture, which opened in 2001 for Black History Month. So February of 2001, the Wells Built Museum opened. And next month, we're celebrating our 20th anniversary. Uh, we came into an area that people viewed as a slum, rundown building, uh, got it renovated, and so it was bold to begin what we started 20 years ago. So we're titling our birthday celebration, 20 Years Bold. I entered politics uh, because on one level, I didn't get a lot of um, encouragement about the Wells Bill. I was told that Paramore was a blighted area, that there was crime and drugs and prostitution, and uh, not many people encouraged me when I talked about opening the museum. Uh, before that, I had been employed as an administrator at Valencia College. And there I started the College Reach Out program for low-income minority students. And I raised money to provide them scholarships so that they could get a college education. That program uh, operated wonderfully for about 10 years. The funds that I raised locally were matched uh, by the state of Florida. And then a decision was made not to fund the program by members of the Florida legislature. And so I went to Tallahassee to talk to legislators who told me that there was a level playing field and everyone had an equal opportunity and there was no need for a program like college reach out. Well, that was different from my reality and my viewpoint. And I began to think that maybe I should go to Tallahassee as a member of the legislature to bring a different perspective. And so after 24 years at Valencia College, I retired, I ran for office, I was elected to the Florida House of Representatives in 2006. And I served in the Florida House from 2006 until 2012 uh, when I ran for the Florida Senate. I served in the Florida Senate from 2012 until 2016. And now I'm back. I'm back in the Florida House of Representatives uh, where I will continue to focus on culture and history uh, and equal justice and equal opportunity. Those are things that are uh, very important uh, to me. And it is very rewarding when you can propose something and see it become reality. There are two things that I'm very proud of uh, with it, my service in the Florida House. One is getting compensation for a, a black citrus worker who was convicted of killing his seven children. 
and he was on death row. And years later, his neighbor, uh, who was very ill, told her caretakers that when she was asked to come over to warm up food for his children while he and his wife worked in the groves, uh, she put poison in the food and all seven children died. He had been in prison for 22 years by that time and he was told that he would be released and he could go on with his life. And when I met him, he was 78 years old and my thinking was, where is he going to go? He has no children. The wife is long gone. He got no retirement, no social security. And so where is he supposed to go? His name is James Joseph Richardson. And I got uh, compensation, $1.2 million for Mr. James Joseph Richardson. I'm very proud of that. I'm also proud of my work to exonerate the Groveland Four, four black men in the town of Groveland who were accused of rape in 1949. And the sheriff uh, shot and killed uh, two of the Groveland Four. One who was 16 years old was sentenced to life and the other was shot but did not die. And when he woke up in the hospital, he said the sheriff the sheriff had said that uh, he tried to attack him. He was shackled and handcuffed uh, to the other person who did die. But he said that he shot us without provocation. And so in 2019, the very first meeting of the Florida cabinet, there were pardons that were issued for all four of these men who were not guilty. So that is a uh, part of what I um, enjoy about being a member of the legislature is being able to help people who have no voice, who have no rep representation. And so that's what being a representative is all about. So I'm delighted to be with you for this celebration of Black History Month. Thank you so much, Representative Thompson. I wanted to remind the audience to add your questions in the chat box. I would now like to introduce our next speaker, Trinae Jones. Trinae is the founder of Rated Clothing. Trinae is an impressive young woman. She's currently going to Valencia College and she's a senior. She started Rated Clothing as a hobby in 2018. Trinae is a one woman operation with Rated Clothing such as creating, learning, financing, investing, managing customer service, social media, photography, editing, marketing, packaging, and shipping. I'm also thrilled to announce that Rated Clothing is our newest local maker featured at Discover Downtown. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Trinae Jones. I am the founder of Rated Clothing. I founded Rated in spring of 2018. Rated is a unique high quality streetwear brand that offers t-shirts, hoodies, hats, and I strive to offer many more in the future. My mission behind Rated is to influence you that you can do anything that you put your mind to. Regardless of the obstacle, you always strive for greatness and keep going strong. On the next slide, you will be able to see some of my hoodies that I offer. They are as of now, the most popular hoodies that I offer. Um, you have the Black Love hoodie and the Black Love t-shirt is being raffled. We also have the orange hoodie, which states that you can do anything you put your mind to. You can raid all obstacles. And then on the back, it states that you can hustle, grind, and execute. And then I also have the rated hoodie. It's a reflective hoodie. And then on the next slide, you will see I have t-shirts. Well, hats, okay, t-shirts. So on the next slide is t-shirts. These are some of my most popular t-shirts as well. Um, there's the long sleeve tie-dye rated clothing t-shirt on the back of it, it states freedom. Then there's the middle t-shirt, which is the rated world t-shirts, and then my trap money t-shirts that are on the right side. And then I also offer hats. There are two hats on my website as of right now. Um, they come in the color of blue and black. It is denim hats and they're also distressed. 
you are able to find these products on my website at www.shoprated.com. And you can also follow me on all social media platforms at shoprated.com or at shoprated. Sorry. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Trine. I would like to introduce our final speaker today, Dr. Cassandra Williams Ken Kelly. Dr. Cassandra Williams Kelly is an ordained minister and spiritual counselor who was inspired to write Issues Without Tissues from her own personal struggles and how she overcame them. These struggles also influenced Dr. Ke Williams Kelly's passion for advocating for victims of domestic violence. On a spiritual journey in pursuit of God and commission to her faith, Dr. William Kelly has traveled the world sharing her love for God's people, guiding her through any major crisis or issue that Dr. Williams Kelly didn't have control over. She refers back to Proverbs 4.23, keep thy heart with all diligence for out of it are the issues of life. Dr. Williams Kelly has also published Wisdom is She and is working on several more inspirational books. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Kelly. Praise the Lord, everyone. As she mentioned, my name is Dr. Cassandra Williams Kelly. I first want to give honor to Jesus Christ, who is truly the head of my life, author and finisher of my faith. I give honor to representative of the 44th District, Geraldine Thompson. I give honor to Tanya Jones. I give honor to Rose Garlic of downtown Orlando and her staff. Truly, it gives me a pleasure to stand before you on this morning to represent uh, and uh, expound on my second book, Issues Without Tissues. I was born in Tampa, Florida, but reared in Jersey City. I moved here as a result of marrying my husband, none other than Chef Wardrin Kelly. This is the second year that I'm here. What inspired me to write this book, Issues Without Tissues, is because of how my life was. I was born into abuse and I suffered at the hands of my parents who really should have nurtured and loved me. Now, I say that but I loved my parents very, very dearly. I just did not like the way that they went about handling things in terms of me and my siblings. Um, issues Without Tissues is a book, it's not only a book of my life, but in the back of it, it's a tool to invite others to listen in to it, to read into it, and maybe they can get deliverance as well. Uh, the story, there's a story of the cover of this book, Issues Without Tissues. First of all, the name of the book, Issues Without Tissues, it really is derived from a scripture because God said in his word that he will wipe away every tear. So on the cover of this book, you will see the dove, which represents the Holy Spirit of God. So the dove is carrying a tissue to the face of this young lady on this book to wipe away her tears because the scripture says God will wipe away every tear from our eyes. Now, on her, on her ear, you will see a white earring, a white pearl earring. That earring represents the great pearl of price. You will see her with her eyes closed and her hands to her face. That represents the humility of God and she is in anticipation of seeking an answer and a word from the Lord. Now underneath the, 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 the holy the dove, you will see a tissue box that is shaped like the ark of the covenant is suspended in air because the stock of the covenant, it was not stationary in the Bible. Inside where the tissue is being pulled is the color red. That represents the blood line of Christ. Now you will see around her neck, a lavender 
a purple necklace. That represents the royalty of God, and purple also represents abuse. Underneath where she is standing, you will see a bed of lilies and different sizes. And because he is the lily of the valley, and he is everywhere. And uh, you will see green, gr green um, plants around the lilies because the green represents new growth. The lilies represent life. Um, there's a little area right by the word issues and it's a dark area because that area represented the darkness that i once suffered in my life but you will see a ray of sunshine about above the on the arc that represents that overpowers the darkness in my life so this book i was inspired to write it issues without tissues and i my thing my 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 only um my only goal is to continue to expound on the word to continue to be an advocate for domestic violence and to continue to share the goodness of the lord thank you very much Thank you, Dr. Williams Kelly. We would like now to answer questions from the audience. the Amway Center was not our neighbor. It is now. Uh, we did not have uh, the Orlando Magic. Uh, we did not have the Florida A&M University College of Law. Uh, we did not have, it used to be Hughes Supply and Bank of America. So more business interests are coming into uh, the Paramore area. I am very concerned that we do not sacrifice history uh, for the sake of revitalization. I think you can have the two at the same time if you incorporate and you very consciously make a decision that we're not going to destroy our history as we uh, look to revitalize the community. So that is my response um, to the first question. Okay, thank you. And the second question, moving forward in 2021, what are some of your key objectives and priorities as a representative of Florida, State Florida? I, uh, as many people, uh, saw all of the unrest that occurred over the summer. We saw a police officer kneel on the neck of George Floyd for almost nine minutes. Uh, and that police officer has a second home in my district, in House District 44. Uh, I do not want to see a repeat of that kind of thing in Florida. So one of my top priorities is police reform. And I have filed a bill to require a database that the Florida Department of Law Enforcement uh, would coordinate. And the database would include by city and by department instances of complaints of excessive force. That officer had 15 complaints of excessive force. And with a database, 
that should have raised a red flag with someone if we're keeping a record. And so that is uh, one of my top priorities so that we can see where the hot spots are, where intervention is necessary, where more training um, may be needed, or some kind of disciplinary action. So that's a, a top priority of mine. I'm also working to make sure that as we approach 2022, that we are able to have more people participate in our democracy by making sure that voting is open and available uh, for more individuals. And so I have filed a bill related to voting that would do a number of things. One is during early voting, you can go to any early voting site and vote anywhere in Orange County, but you can't do that on election day. You have to vote in your precinct. I want to get rid of that. We have the technology now that allows us by computer to uh, see if you live in Orange County and to have on election day the same kind of thing that you would have for early voting. So I filed uh, that bill. I've also filed a bill because we've had in law a requirement that our teachers provide instruction on the history of African Americans and the history of the Holocaust. And some of you may know that in Palm Beach County, a parent called a high school principal and asked, how are you teaching the history of the Holocaust? The principal's response was, we have um, books and material, but we don't mandate it because I'm not sure, the principal said, that the Holocaust occurred. That made national news. So we've had a law on the books since 1992 that requires this instruction and it's not being done. My bill would withhold the salary of the school superintendent if there is not proof through a report that this instruction is taking place. So I filed that bill. So those are uh, three of my top priorities. Thank you so much. Great answers to those questions. I now have a question for Trené. Trené, would you please join us? Okay, the question to you, Trené, what advice would you give to someone that wants to start their own business? The advice that I would give somebody that wants to start their own business is that when things aren't going as planned, it's easy to become discouraged. Remember your goals and keep the mindset that you're capable of rating all obstacles. You're capable of doing anything that you put your mind to. Don't let the things that are not going in the direction that you wanted them to go into discourage your overall goal. Thank you so much. And I do have one final question for Cassandra. Dr. Cassandra Williams-Kelly, please join us. Thank you so much. Did you always want to write a book or what made you want to write the book? Well, um, no, I did not always want to write a book. What inspired me to write the book was that uh, as a counselor, I was counseling at Northern State Prison, over 3,000 men. I counseled them one-on-one. -on -one. And when I would tell my story, I realized that something was happening. And when I would go into the shelters and then I became a chaplain at two hospitals in Jersey City, and I would tell my story there, and something would happen. And I said, you know what, I need to put this into a book. And that's really what inspired me because you have a lot of broken women as well as men because I have counseled men, um, abuse, men that were abused as well. When people think of abuse, they automatically sometimes want to think of it in terms of the woman as the victim. But that's not true, as we know all the time. So uh, I started sharing my story, and people came inspired. People came delivered and set free. And that's what motivated me and inspired me to write the book, because I didn't realize until later on in life, I was so insecure and I had a very inferiority complex at a young age. So it was only later when I realized, Cassandra, you are unique, 
you are important, you are irreplaceable, and you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Thank you so much, Dr. Williams Kelly. Thank you all three speakers. Great answers to the questions. We really appreciate it. Um, Thank you. Before we conclude this pre presentation, I would like you to like to remind you to stop by Discover Downtown to meet our speakers. Also, I'd like to share with you a few up and coming Black History Month events. Martin Luther King Dream Series Session 2, Understanding Bias Workshop, which will be held on Thursday, February 4th from 6.30 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. Martin Luther King Dream Series Session 3, Conversation on Race, on Race Program, Thursday, February 18th, 6.30 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. Through Unity, We Shall Overcome, presented by the Mayor's Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Commission, which will be held on Saturday, February 20th, 6.30 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. And finally, What's Up Downtown, Empowerment of Black Entrepreneurs, which will be held on Thursday, March 4th, 8.30 a.m. Thank you all for attending our event today and have a wonderful day and thanks for being with us here today.